Um, you know, it seems like for over a week now that I think uh, conditions have been rather poor. Uh, I've noticed that some of the uh, uh, foreign broadcasts here on 40 seem like it's very fluttery, uh, almost like, uh, you know, when there's a, when there's a, a solar eruption or something. And I've noticed on 160 uh, that the condition, that the, um, the uh, I think the absorption has been very high because the signals have been very weak on 160. So I uh, haven't really noticed uh, any extraordinary band conditions the last few days. WA3 VJB from K4KYV. Yeah, I can't say that I've noticed um, anything out of the ordinary. I, I'm not on 160 to really comment on that, but 40 meters seems to have been fairly normal. I get on in the mornings, and there's a, usually a pretty healthy contingent of people between, oh, 8 o'clock and maybe 11 o'clock. And what I do notice here at 11 o'clock or so is a, a fading out of the band. I think it gets tired. As the sun gets higher up in the sky, the signals kind of go away for a while. And they don't start to come back in until maybe 1, 2 o'clock or so. There's a gap in there right at midday. And then by the time 3, maybe 4 o'clock rolls around, signals are coming in pretty well. And I'm talking about from the northeast. Although today I had a really good QSO with somebody in North Carolina coming up the coast. Will KF4 IZE. Uh, had tremendous signal, and he was running nothing more than a TX-1. And then I worked another guy. Uh, where was he at? WA-4EVK. I didn't get his location, but he was running an AF-68, and he was coming in pretty well. So the band's got some life. I, I just don't think it's a, a consistent propagation area that it covers. Uh, so, you know, it's it's got enough life to keep me stuck to it anyway. I went down to uh, 80 meters last night, 37.33, for a group called the What's for Dinner Net. <laughs> it's, it's a fanciful thing. It, it kind of satirical on, on net operation where the order of business has to do with the, uh, the recipe for the night. And once that's done, it's, it's back to a typical roundtable. But, hey, it's a net, so it's got the right of way over all other things. <laughs> Well, I'll have some more thoughts on where I think uh, old Bob was coming from on his article on the next over. But uh, he did reply a couple of times, and he, he seemed to backpedal. And when he backpedaled, it was something short of correcting his error. But I do think he was uh, prone to some imagination. K4KYV at the top of the hour. This is WA3VJB Annapolis. Oh, very good, Paul. K4KYV uh, uh, returning in uh yeah, uh, I, I hadn't talked to him for a while. Uh, well, I think I did talk to him one time, maybe about a week or so ago. I think he'd been sick. I think he'd had some kind of a, of a health issue and had, had, had not been on the air very much for uh, for several weeks. Uh, but he said he was recovering and he was back on on the air. But uh, um, but anyway, well, I'd be interested on your take of what you. Um, uh, you said you had the next go around. I'd be interested in that. And uh, um, uh, as far as uh, uh, as far as the band's concerned, uh, uh, on, on 75, I haven't really uh, 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 been getting on 75, 80 meters very much uh, lately. I, I just don't seem to hear a lot of uh, uh, good strapping signals, uh, and it seems like that. Uh, you know, maybe the same phenomenon that I'm hearing on 160. Now, I have one, uh, uh, you know, something's different here from where you are is that uh, there's not a lot of uh, stations around, uh, you know, within a radius of uh, several hundred miles. You know, there's, just, there's a, a limited amount of activity. But, you know, on the East Coast, you know, you guys, it's, uh, uh, there's stations all over the place that, uh, you know, you know, you know, within a radius of two or three hundred miles, there are plenty of uh, stations to talk to, but down here sometimes uh, there's not, you know, so uh, uh, I pretty much have to uh, um, uh, work stations at a distance, and if the uh, conditions are not conducive for uh, uh, contacts over, uh, you know, over, over several hundred miles distance, uh, I just, uh, you know, I don't hear your readable signals, and that's especially the problem on 160, because uh, uh, the activity on that band has dwindled way back um, c compared with what it was when I um, first got the uh, the antenna up and got on the air with it in, in 1980. Uh, 
uh, the um, uh, the the activity on that, on that band is is dwindled way down. So uh, I, 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 you know, I think on all the bands, I'm not hearing the uh, activity we, we once uh, heard. It seems like that uh, on 75, though, a lot of the activity in the early evening, and you know, it's all net activity, and that's you know, sometimes that's about all. I can, if I didn't want to. Uh, uh, get into a net, I wouldn't be able to talk to anybody because I hear all the net activity and when the, uh, the net sign off, I don't hear anybody else. And the band just kind of uh, is vacant. Um, so, uh, WA3VJV from K4KYV. K4KYV, WA3VJV, right back. Yeah, it's, um, it's a definite decline in activity that I'm noticing as well. And I think that's part of the reason why I wanted to uh, help old Bob there revise his perspective on current trends because it's true almost every weeknight is uh, a, a AM net on 3880 or 3885 which precludes the opportunity for an impromptu one on one with somebody or a, an unscheduled round table with people because the frequency really is in use and you know I, I think most of these nets are nothing more than a scheduled round table but at the same time, it does block off the uh, the more casual use of the frequency instead of one that has structure and schedule and everybody convenes at the appointed hour. So I was trying to point this out to Bob, and I, I think my letter of seven years ago actually did a, uh, a more diplomatic job of it. And what I was about to tell you is how, it, how that led up. I had seen a video somewhere that Bob was uh, featured in and he repeated uh, at least three times the AM windows that he had specified. And it was a very strong tilt toward uh, making that a, a mandate or at least a strong suggestion for the AM community. It's like he, on one hand, he was saying, oh, AM's great, it's a lot of fun. And on the other hand, you got to stay in these areas or else, and, and the wording of one of it, or else you're going to upset people or wording to that effect, which uh, implied that uh, AM was something to apologize for or something to place in a secondary status to others who might wish to have a spot on the dial. Of course, I see red when that happens because we're on a par with any other activity that's not emergency. So I wrote that letter to him that you'll see in amongst the responses because I, I dug it up in my Yahoo uh, email box from years ago. And I posted it. I said, look, here's what's going on in the 10 years of my observation in the Eastern Time Zone, or however I put it. I think I said Eastern Seaboard. There's a lot of AM activity. The AM windows, and I, I put them in quotes, are, are overwhelmed. They're, they're saturated, and they're, they, you know, we need to move. And I even cited a, an effort on my part to contact by email some of the net control operators for the AM gatherings, and most of which I participate in, by the way, and say, look, here's an idea. The AWA has a Sunday afternoon gathering on 3837. Why don't we make a grid? You know, one of those, uh, it's like a scheduled uh, block your time off grid, and we'll publish it, and everybody gets to enter when their net is, how long it would last, and what day of the week it is. And then that can be the agreed-upon net frequency that everybody can promote as part of promoting their own net. And it also happens to get it out of the way of the traditional gathering point. Well, not a soul was interested in it. Every single one of them had some reason or other for saying things are fine the way they are. So I, I was disheartened, but what I just figured is that there wasn't enough incentive for people to move. And that's the way I left it. And that was seven years ago. Now things have only gotten worse with more nets that have, that have cropped up. And I put worse in quotes because it's not bad that this activity exists. It's only bad because we are like so many cows in the, in the pasture and we're all grazing shoulder to shoulder on the same spot of grass when it doesn't need to be that way. So I thought perhaps seven years ago I could convince Bob to somehow refine his messaging because uh, we do appreciate him promoting the, the fact that there are gathering points by also including that you may find us elsewhere. Of course, I, 
uh, as I have many times, sometimes on 75, I call it the center of the AM window, the AM ghetto. It used to be a lot worse than it is now, because it, you know, it used to be that all of the, uh, you know, the so-called AM window frequencies would be uh, uh, crammed with signals, and there'd be slot buckets in, uh, kind of trying to nudge in between, and then there'd be a, a few trying to, to uh, maliciously interfere, and uh, uh, it, it was a real zoo, uh, um, and, and, I, and that's why I started calling it the uh, AM ghetto, but, uh, uh, and, and I liked it very much, you know, when the phone bands were first expanded down to 3600, uh, and you know, I remember a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, uh, went to the extra trouble to upgrade to uh, extra class license, because, you know, you can't get a, an advanced class anymore, so if you just had a general, uh, you know, you're stuck in the general uh, portion of the band, uh, unless you do upgrade to extra, and, and a lot of these guys upgraded extra just uh, specifically so they could operate AM down uh, um, uh, on the low end of the band, and I, I remember when it first uh, uh, opened up, you know, we had the band wa band warming party. You probably remember that, and uh, and everybody was saying, "Oh, how great this is!" You know, they uh, don't have all the QRM and the nonsense that's going up on uh, on 85 and 80, uh, and uh, uh, and you know, and it, it, it worked out very well. But then, but then once the novelty wore off, just one by one, they just slowly trickled back up to the old stomping grounds, and uh, and now it's. Uh, uh, it's very seldom that I actually hear um, uh, activity down there. When I do, uh, you know, I can usually uh, um, can get into some very nice uh, uh, QSOs, but then much of the time I don't hear anybody and call CQ and nobody comes back. So, uh, so kind of, uh, you know, once the once the novelty wore off, everybody said, "Okay, been there, done that," and then they are back to the uh, old frequencies again. So. Uh, uh, but I, uh, uh, I I do like to get down there from from time to time. But uh, but like I say, I just haven't been getting on 75 as much uh, uh, lately as I used to. And and then I do 160 because uh, you know I went to a lot of trouble back in uh, 1981. Uh, you know I put up this antenna system. I put up the tower and uh, uh, the. Um, the doublet antenna on the tower, and then the tower on the base insulator, and, with, and then laid out uh, three miles of radio wire around the base of the tower. You know, I went all out for a, a commercial grade 160-meter uh, antenna system, and um, and that was when the, just just when the band had been uh, reopened, they got rid of Loran, and they were opening the band back up as a full-fledged amateur band. And, and at that time. Um, uh, the activity got pretty uh, dense. There was a, um, uh, I remember times when the, the whole band would be just like 75, uh, you know, during the prime time uh, hours. You, uh, you, ha you had to look for a clear spot, but then that's just gradually dwindled down and uh, to where there's uh, so little activity on there now. You know, I think if today um, the activity on that band were uh, um, uh, well, let's see. How, how can I put that? That um, or that if today, if I were starting out, uh, like I like I did in 1980-81, you know, if I were repeating that scenario today, and and uh, uh, I don't think I would have gone to all the trouble to uh, to build the antenna system that I did, you know, the tower and the radios and all that uh, for the amount of activity on there. I say, oh, it's not worth it because. Uh, not enough people to uh, uh, to talk to. You know, I, I can get on the air, and you know, everybody says, "Yeah, I've got a good signal all over the country." But then, if, um, but if I can't hear anybody coming back to me, um, you know, what's the point? And, and it seems like a lot of the signals uh, when I do work in an AM station, they you know, they're using a transceiver without any amplifier, running about uh, 20 or 25 watts on AM, and. Uh, um, and especially on on uh, 160 as well as on 75, uh, um, uh, you're not going to do a whole lot most of the time. With uh, uh, you know, you, uh, you need to get more fire in the wire and get the wire higher. So, uh, um, but I see uh, I see a lot of that uh, these days. You know, I, I can uh, everybody can hear me, but I can't hear them because they're all piss weak. Uh, WA3VJB from K4KYV. 
Yeah, I mean, I find that too on 40 meters and everywhere, really. Uh, people who are trying AM for the first time or uh, without a whole lot of awareness or exposure to it uh, think they're going to sound like you. Or they think like they're going to sound like anybody who has taken time with their station, both in signal and in audio quality. They, they, I mean, it's, it's subconscious. They don't know necessarily how much power we're running or, or what we've done to get the audio to sound like this. All they know is that we're on AM and that their transceiver has AM as a mode. And usually people accept what's given to them by the manufacturer. Because you know there's not a lot of experimentation anymore, or even technical investigation. So if it says AM, well, gee, these guys are on AM, and it's subconscious that they must sound like them. Well, no, it's not true at all. And, you know, you and I both know that. Now, Timmy, believe it or not, well, and I say that as a preamble, but he's actually gotten frustrated and fed up in some cases with a number of people who, who check in and, and can't really be heard. And Tim has always been one to go out of his way to help somebody sound better. But even he, and I say that collectively, has become frustrated at the number of people, the, the proportion of people who otherwise would be welcome in this part of the hobby, but haven't studied what it takes to achieve what they're hearing. And it's a, it's a damn shame because, you know, you, you can't bring a, a round table to its knees by somebody who's S3. Uh, amongst S9 and 10 and 20 over 9 stations. And they hear that we lean into it for a while and we talk for a while. And sure enough, the weaker they are, the longer they talk. <laughs> and uh, there goes the frequency. Because somebody will come in and say, ah, is the frequency in use? Or maybe not. And they'll just start up. <laughs> and, uh, so I think that was part of the, um, the motivation behind uh, disabusing Bob in his presumption that the windows were adequately handling the number of people now on AM, because it's not the case. And when I said that he had conceded that some of his story details were fanciful, it was because he called one of the people challenging him, not me, but one of the others who challenged him, correct on all facts, or correct on all points. Your comments are all correct. So without specifically accepting responsibility for fictional parts of his story he did discharge the entire writing as being uh, uh, exaggerated at best and wrong at most I uh, I appreciated your your historical account of where the bands had been you know the the general or sorry the the above 3900 versus the below 3900 gatherings that existed at the time and how the expansion of, of the other mode continued downward. It seems to me we almost have the flip side of that with the rising popularity of this part of the hobby. We're expanding and not only deserve more space on the dial, but are, are entitled to it. K4KYV, WA3VJB. Yeah, K4KYV. Well, I think that, uh, you know, that whole uh, thing, remember the buzzword, it was uh, spectrum conservation. Uh, you know, you know that was uh, kind of the buzzwords back in the 80s and um, 80s and 90s, and, uh, and, and of course the bands were very crowded back then. Uh, there, there was a lot of activity, and uh, and sometimes you did have to hunt for a space to operate. Um, but uh, but I think that that era has passed because now, um, you know, especially on a week night. Uh, and sometimes even on weekend nights, um, the band can be very quiet, no static. You tune across the band, and there's just big swathes of uh, unoccupied frequency um, available. So th the real is there's there's no need to uh, confine ourselves to uh, a certain narrowly defined windows or uh, or worry about uh, 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 you know having such a narrow signal um, and to uh, make sure the bandwidth uh, doesn't increase uh, such and such because uh, um, there's not that much activity now and 
and, and you know that might even be uh, counterproductive if uh, you know if all this uh, vacant space lies fallow and nobody's using it, then somebody else might say, oh, these these guys don't need the amount of spectrum they have. Maybe um, cut back on it because uh, um, somebody else could uh, put it to better use than, than they are. So you know it may even be counterproductive uh, uh, t taking that approach. But. Uh, 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 but it, it's kind of, you know, the whole thing has kind of become a, a moot point. And, and I've never really uh, strictly uh, observed the AM windows or any, uh, you know, strictly observed, uh, you know, say, oh, uh, we, you're not supposed to operate in this part of the van. I, I've always pretty much uh, uh, operated wherever I, I could find a clear spot. And uh, I've never really had a lot of problems. You know, occasionally, you know, I had a... Uh, you know, a few people make snide remarks about saying, uh, "Why don't you get the AM back up where it belongs?" You know, I have run into a few like that, but it's a very, it's rare. And uh, and I use it just to, you know, it, uh, the best way to uh, treat uh, that sort of thing is to ignore it, just pretend like it doesn't exist. Because if you acknowledge, uh, uh, you know, if you even acknowledge their existence, then you've made their day. So the best thing to do is just. Uh, uh, going about your business and pretend like uh, you know just pretend like they don't exist and uh, uh, ignore it. That's uh, that's what I do here. Uh, but uh, uh, but but something else too. I remember uh, back uh, you know right, right after they um, expanded the bands. I, you know I, something I was was strongly uh, uh, in favor of was uh, on 40 meters. Is you know. Uh, to uh, expand the phone man all the way down to uh, um, uh, to 7100. I always thought, well, you know, what's the point in that little 25 kc uh, CW segment from uh, 7100 to 7125? Um, why not just go ahead and make it uh, going to go down to an even uh, 7100? And uh, but there there were a lot of guys who were very much. Uh, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, rapidly uh, against that idea. Uh, you know, like there was something really precious about that little 25 kc uh, uh, segment above 7100. Uh, but I've kind of uh, backed off that now because the, um, uh, you know, even on this band, the, uh, um, the congestion is is not really there. That it's a problem because I remember right after the, um, you know, right after the broadcast um, went away. Uh, um, on 71 to 72, that um, well, you know, when the broadcast went away, that uh, um, it had got very, it was very congested, very crowded. Was, you know, everybody and his brother tried to uh, get on here, but I've noticed now that uh, that that's kind of uh, dwindled away. So, uh, um, you know, it's not really such an issue as it was. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, but but I, I don't think the FCC is going to do anything now because I I, I don't I, I think that's the last thing they won't even be bothered with is uh, uh, doing anything to uh, uh, greatly uh, uh, change the amateur radio frequencies. You know, remember how how many years ago that the AWRL was they were complaining that uh, extending the phone band on 75 down to 3600 that that was going too far and they uh, were uh, were petitioning the FCC to uh, um, to take that back and then uh, um, and uh, cut the uh, the phone band off at 3650 rather than uh, 3600. I know they were preaching that for a while. I think they actually did uh, submit a petition. Now, how many years has it been since they uh, um, submitted that petition and, and the FCC has not acted on it? So I, I don't think the FCC is really interested in uh, in doing anything with the amateur radio frequencies uh, um, uh, these days. So, you know, they just, they just leave it like it is. And, you know, they, they, they don't want to bother with it. I think because of that... Uh, um, there was some member of Congress that uh, um, was, was uh, pushing, uh, you know, this uh, digital bandwidth thing, baud rate uh, issue that's been up. I, I think that's the only reason that they have acted on that is because uh, some member of Congress was uh, um, was uh, about to actually try to introduce uh, legislation in Congress to uh, mandate it, and I think the FCC uh, uh, just went ahead and, and went along with it. But but that's the only. Uh, Action I've seen the FCC uh, taking on on any amateur radio issue in a long, long time. Uh, WA1 VJB from K4KYV. 
K4KYV, WA3, VJB, right back. Yeah, that's the work of uh, David Sadal, who is now the league's attorney. He is a former Senate staffer and knows how the legislative process works as compared with their previous counsel, who was more of a corporate lawyer, whose clients also included the National Association of Broadcasters. This guy, Sadal, worked on Capitol Hill for more than 30 years. I met him when W3 USS was still around. W3 United States Senate that was founded by Barry Goldwater, R. Arizona. They dismantled it because Sadal retired. He was the last one there. And the charter or whatever it was that they, uh, they used to authorize their presence there said that there had to be some sort of Senate staff or a member on the premises to uh, to take charge or take responsibility for it. And he was the last one. We had a member of the House who was or is licensed, a uh, an Oregon senator, Greg Walden, I forget his calls, a Republican from Oregon, who is a former broadcast station owner. I, I've talked with him a number of times and invited him over to K3RTV, the radio television museum, about uh, 15 miles outside of Washington. We were going to try to get him over there for the heavy metal rally and, and get him on the air and kind of show him the radio because we had a 300G over there like this one and a, and a little Gates studio ad and an open reel machine, all the stuff he would have known, you know. And something came up that he wasn't able to show up, but it, he was like the last guy I remember who had any kind of active license. So Sadal got hired by the ARRL to succeed uh, Chris Imlay. And with the lack of action on various petitions within the FCC as an agency, he decided to nudge the process along by meeting with staff of Debbie Lesko, a Republican from either Arizona or Nevada, I forget which, who uh, later decided to retire from her uh, her office and not seek re-election. But while she was there, the Democrats had the majority, and she was a Republican, so her proposal wasn't going to go anywhere. And uh, it did act as a shot across the bow to the FCC that they'd better do something about it. So that's some of the mechanism behind that is because of who was pushing it on behalf of the ARRL. And the, to your earlier point about uh, the spectrum efficiency and, and the other uh, mantras that the league was trying to achieve, you know, that was specious. That was not something that, uh, as they implied, was coming from the FCC. Because I actually made contact with the retired FCC staffer that they used to like to quote for spectrum efficiency as, as being a goal. Now, it might be nice. But it was never anything the FCC was pressuring the amateur community to achieve. In fact, when I asked him about it directly, he said, no, it's, it's a, a hobby service. I enjoyed AM myself, he said, and he cited some holocrafter model that he had. I love the sound of AM. And there's room for it on the band, so go for it, was essentially what he said. I said, well, how about the spectrum efficiency part of that? Where, where is that coming from? They said, well, it's, it's nice to, to achieve, but you're not channelized, you're mixed mode, you're supposed to avoid deliberate interference, and you're supposed to find a clear spot on the dial suited to your passband. So all this stuff was quite a different picture coming from the horse's mouth than how the ARRL was spinning it at that time. And I think part of what Heil's uh, approach was to this is that, you know, we'd better stay in the back of the bus you know, because we take up more room and, you know, there, there's a lot of band congestion and all these assumptions that really aren't valid anymore. And that's why I got provoked, because it's not true. And, I, I you know, I was ready to do battle to, to an even greater degree than I did. But he folded. He, he admitted that it was made up. And the uh, the coals kind of were left to, uh, to to turn to ash. So we'll leave it at that. But yeah, your, uh, your recounting of things, including the actual regulatory definition, as well as the practical result of those regulations, was very useful to push back on the idea that the cited frequencies in his posting 
or somehow regulatory gospel or somehow had been handed down from the elders as the result of some leadership meeting between sideband and AM. No, it's not true. K4KYV, WA3VJB. Yeah, K4KYV. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, uh, you know, the, the original, uh, of course, the original gentleman's agreement was uh, was on 75. Uh, you know, that, that sideband was, was above 3,900 and AM was below 3,900. Remember, it was that way for several years because I, I first got active uh, around in 1960. And, uh, you know, uh, albeit with low power, but I, I was active from 1960 on. Actually, in 1959, I, 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 I upgraded to general in December. I think it was the 4th of December of uh, 1959 that I actually, um, uh, the license came in the mail. And um, But I, I remember at the time, uh, you know, that was kind of, you know, uh, you know, everybody see well the gentleman's agreement. You know, where AM and sideband, you know, the, the uh, dividing point was 3,900, and I think that uh, had, had kind of evolved. I don't, uh, I don't know if there was any, uh, uh, if, if anybody had had ever uh, um, uh, made any statements or uh, or advocated. I think that just, I think it just kind of evolved, and that's the way it was. But then, as sideband became uh, more numerous and AM dwindled, you know, they they naturally did move down lower in frequencies, and, and of course that was back in the around 1963. I remember when the when, when the great AM versus sideband wars were uh, occurring uh, on 75, and that was about the same time, you know, that the sideband for the masses transceivers hit the market, and, and you know, and all these want want to be sidebanders that had been running AM for. So many years could finally get on sideband, so you know got all these, these little cheap uh, swans and galaxies on the air, and uh, uh, and with their sweet team finals, and uh, um, and then and then there got to be uh, uh, you, you know a lot of friction, and so that's when the great AM sideband wars uh, hit. I think from uh, it started in 1963, and I think it actually ran until uh, maybe 65 or so. I think it began to kind of a uh, of, of a dwindle around you know in the mid 60s and then uh, when incentive licensing came along you know that kind of uh, completely rocked the boat and uh, and I remember something ironical about uh, incentive licensing it was supposed to you know the the whole uh, purpose of it was supposedly to uh, encourage uh, um uh, encourage technical competence and experimentation in the amateur radio community because there was concern that uh, uh, that the, the hobby was becoming more of just uh, uh, well uh, appliance operators or plug and play operators, however you want to, to uh, put it. That uh, um, there that, 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 that um, experimentation was dwindling and uh, and and people were losing interest in the technical aspects of radio. So that that's. And at the same time, uh, uh, the bands were becoming very crowded back in the early 60s. So, uh, uh, you know, those two issues, that's where they came up with the idea of incentive licensing. And that would uh, kind of thin out the interference and at the same time uh, would encourage uh, amateurs to uh, become more technically competent, you know, from uh, having to study and pass these exams. But but actually, it, it, it had the opposite effect because I, I noticed that... Uh, Right after incentive licensing went into effect, that uh, um, uh, you know the the old home brew rigs, you know whether they were on uh, on AM or sideband or whatever, the the old home brew rigs just very rapidly uh, started disappearing, and um, and, uh, and and so, well, so did AM because the vast majority of AMers uh, back then had general class licenses. There, there weren't that many who who had. Uh, 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 well, we well, at that time, extra class uh, uh, didn't uh, carry any uh, additional privileges, and, and also advanced class didn't uh, carry any additional privileges because uh, the advanced class were the uh, the old class A operators from back in the early 50s. Uh, um, you know, when they had the class A B uh, um, uh, uh, type of uh, of, um, uh, of privileges. Um, and 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 uh, you know that was a holdover when the FCC just uh, said okay everybody can operate on 
sequences that are people more class distinctions of privileges, uh, but they let the advanced class operators keep the advanced class tickets, and so they were about the only ones that had advanced class tickets when that went into effect because, uh, uh, you know, everybody else uh, um, had generals, except, you know, there were a few that had extras, but um, for the most part, uh, it, it was mostly generals. So as soon as that went into effect, uh, right away, uh, 3,900 to 4,000 became uh, especially congested because, you know, all these guys had been had used uh, 3,800 to 4,000 were suddenly crammed, you know, 90% of them were crammed up between 3,900 and 4,000. So there they, they uh, indeed was not room uh, for uh, very many AM signals. And uh, uh, so I think a lot of the guys just gave up and said, oh, you know, this is too crowded. You, you, you just can't make a go of it on AM up here. So they just uh, uh, quit. So, uh, you know, very soon after incentive licensing went into effect, uh, AM almost disappeared. And also the uh, number of... Uh, uh, of, of stations on the air using homebrew equipment uh, of, with, of any mode seem like that uh, greatly uh, uh, dwindled. So it, so it seems like incentive licensing had the opposite effect uh, than what it set out to be, that if anything, it made the plug-and-play operators uh, um, much more uh, uh, predominant rather than, uh, uh, you know, they're trying to revive uh, technical interest in, uh, in home brewing and stuff like that. Uh, uh, WA3VJB from K4KYV. K4KYV, WA3VJB, right back. Good transmission, by the way. Signal's holding up nicely. Well, I don't know if people were sophisticated politically back then or not, Don. You might be able to answer this, but it almost sounds like a hidden agenda behind incentive licensing to propagate the store-bought radio that could help the fortunes of those selling them, for one thing, but also the fortunes of, uh, let's say, magazines or others who were accepting the advertising from those companies. I don't know if things were that simple that that could have been achieved by a regulatory fiat, but it sure sounds like uh, at least part of an agenda that somebody thought about that there wasn't that much money in homebrew component level construction. But boy, these uh, these high high fine business store bought transceivers are pretty cool, and look at how many of them we can jam on the band. I I don't know if things were that sophisticated then. These days, I wouldn't put it past anybody to have come up with something like that. I mean, how many Johnny Johnson petitions did we wind up seeing in the, in the late 70s, you know, 10 years later, that had uh, ostensibly a, a good intent, but oh, by the way, happened to harm this part of the hobby here? Yeah, well, that's what, that's what I mean. Could that have been part of incentive licensing? Now, for my part, you know, I acknowledge that this is part of my earliest thumb to the nose of uh, league politics specifically, but I always cited incentive licensing as the reason I upgraded from general to advanced. Because in order to talk to the guys around 3885 in the early 1970s, I had to have at least an advanced class license, because the general class license, wasn't, isn't that uh, the same breakpoint, the 3900? Well, I couldn't go below 3900 if I was just a general. So incentive licensing for me was to get my advance so I could join you guys around 3085. And of course, this was uh, a, a contraindication to what they, they may have had in mind, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have a homebrew transmitter that was left incomplete. It was uh, a 1953 or 1954 Robert Orr radio handbook design and the guy who started building it did a really nice job putting the modules together bud chassis and tube sockets and the plate tank and never finished it because sideband came in and then he up and died and i think i've told you this story before but in 1975 or so i saw an index card with these uh these components for sale rf tank oh by the way there's a modulator uh, the RF tank might make a great amplifier, a pair of 4-250As, four, four HDVL swinging link. And I'm saying, no, don't, don't make an amp out of it. And I, I called the two guys who were listed on there, and I acquired both the, the modulator chassis that was unfinished and the RF tank. 
and uh, you know went ahead and got that put together and had it on the air for so many years. So we did manage to save one of the old homebrew systems, Don. And that's the one I was using up on 10. Actually, that was my first big rig on 75 that you and I probably talked on in the uh, mid to late 70s from my parents' house. And then when I, when I moved out here and had a room in the house, it would have still been on uh, 80 and 40, 75 and 40, before I got the T368 in the early 1980s. So that's my, uh, my radio history anyway regarding that point. So the signal's holding up. Let me kick it back to you for any further comment on, on that. And uh, I'm going to hope that today's uh, occupancy of the band and operating trends l indeed leaves a, a lot more places on the dial to fill up. And to pull out one of the points that you made a little bit earlier, I, I think it, it, we can avoid the unintended side effect of declining band occupancy by numbers by still filling up those spaces with types of modes like ours but that's uh that's something that could be a slippery slope and <laughs> could generate uh problems of its own what do you think k4 kyv wa3 vjb yeah k4 kyv well uh, yeah I, I don't know that would uh uh i guess it would be just speculation how that could uh, play out but uh uh, but I, you know, I don't really see any any great problem uh, right now. I just wish more people would. Uh, um, uh, well, I, actually, I wish more people would uh, uh, on 75 and would move down below. You know, you know where it's it can be less congested. Although, well, the the congestion congestion issue. Uh, uh, you know, unless there's a quorum test on this, uh, it doesn't seem to really be a problem. I noticed that. Uh, on, on 75, you know, one of the most uh, uh, obnoxious quorum tests uh, uh, of all, I think, is the uh, the Pennsylvania CUSO party. I know that that thing comes on, and uh, it seems like that for some reason the uh, uh, participants in that quorum test tend to be uh, very uh, rude and aggressive uh, uh, in their operating uh, habits. And... Um, uh, I know it used to be that when, whenever it was a weekend for the Pennsylvania uh, uh, CUSO party that you could, uh, um, you know, the whole band would, would be uh, uh, packed with uh, um, uh, packed with the signals, and it was and uh, they they would very aggressively uh, would uh, just you know come right on top of an existing QSO like it wasn't there. I, I remember that was a, um, was always an issue of conflict. Uh, but I've noticed lately, the last uh, few years, that even you know, even when the Pennsylvania uh, CUSO party comes on, you can still find uh, open spaces to operate that uh, where there, there's not any uh, interference. So, uh, um, you know, I think the whole you know the whole issue about bandwidth and spectrum conservation, I think that's uh, um, kind of a, a, a moot point uh, these days. But I remember, uh, you know, that was Johnny Johnson's thing. You know, when they first. Uh, because uh, uh, I happened to be at the FCC forum in Dayton, uh, you know, when Johnny Johnston, uh, um, he conducted the forum, and, you know, when he announced uh, uh, docket 20777, and and then they had a question and answer period afterwards, and, uh, you know, that was, that was one of the... Uh, uh, that was one of the points I brought up. I said, you know, there's something uh, uh, that's not right about this thing because the title of that uh, proposal was deregulation. You know, they, they, they called it deregulation, but yet it was going to uh, deregulate our mode out of existence. And I remember I asked him, you know, well, how do you justify, uh, you know, well, it not only would have affected AM, it would it would have affected, uh, uh, I think, Fastscan TV would have uh, uh, suffered the same fate, and then uh, uh, and so on, and and you know, that's what he, and that was his response. Oh, spectrum conservation. Uh, you know, that was uh, uh, that was the uh, the buzzwords that rolled right off the tip of his tongue as soon as I brought that up. Um, spectrum conservation. But, you know, uh, this is a hobby. You know, whoever who heard uh, of, of it? And efficient hobby you know that just uh, um, you know a, a hobby that's supposed to be efficient um, you know that's just not the nature of the beast so uh, 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 but anyway you know I'm glad that a lot of that uh, nonsense has kind of uh, gone away because you know a lot of the old uh, 
um, the older generation that were uh, so adamant uh, about that, you know, uh, that was largely the, uh, the generation maybe before uh, your time and my time, and then uh, um, and most of those uh, guys have. Uh, um, you know, if they're still alive, you know, they you, you might say they've aged out of the hobby, if they even if they're still around anymore. So, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, I think that whole uh, uh, that whole uh, um, uh, set uh, of, uh, of people has um, kind of faded into oblivion now. So the uh, uh, the generation that's on now, you know, didn't go through the uh, you know the great AM slot bucket wars of the '60s and uh, um, and all of the uh, promotion back in the the 50s and 60s when uh, you know there was this um, um, uh, uh, it was a uh, uh, you know a, a, a deliberate a conscious uh, um, campaign to uh, 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 for sideband, you know, that uh, to get rid of AM, that a- AM is obsolete. You, uh, uh, you know, everybody uh, has to go on sideband. You know, it seemed like that was almost, uh, uh, you know, kind of the uh, um, uh, the uh, the policy. You know, uh, uh, amateur radio clubs all over the country, uh, the, the magazines, the manufacturers, the AWRL, like you know, uh, you know, everywhere, everywhere you went, that's that's what you were running into. And that was one of the reasons that I never got on sideband is because I resented, you know, I very strongly resented, uh, um, you know, all the pressure that was being exerted to say, well, you know, you have to uh, um, uh, get rid of the AM station and, and go sideband. Uh, and I, I very strongly resented that. So so that kind of made me, uh, um, uh, you know, say, well, come hell or high water, I'm going to stay on AM regardless. You know, if, if they hadn't been for that, I probably... You know, I might have at one, at one uh, uh, well, I might have eventually said, well, yeah, maybe I'll uh, get some kind of sideband rig and you know, operate that mode as well. Uh, but but that made me, uh, you know, that uh, uh, pressure that was being exerted um, from every direction, that just made me more determined than ever. Well, you know, I'm not going to go along with it. So, uh, uh, you know, I never did. Uh, in fact, uh, even to this day, I've never owned a sideband rig. Uh, WA3 VJB from K4KYV. I have one. Yes, sir. And that's the 101W, Ray 3BJB. Oh, yes, you're still coming through uh, loud and clear. There were a couple of times when you faded down, uh, but then you um, uh, popped right back up again. So I don't think the band's uh, about to drop out from um, uh, beneath us yet, although 40 meters can be very fickle, um, as, as, as you well know. And, um, well, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, it, well, it, well, as, as far as what Bob was, was talking about, I, I, yeah, I remember, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can remember back, uh, you know, back in the, uh, I guess in the uh, 60s and early 70s, you know, sometimes you'd hear some uh, people on AM and they'd almost, uh, they would almost be apologetic because they were running AM. And... Uh, and of course, a lot of the uh, AM operators back then, uh, you know, um, couldn't uh, afford a sideband rig, and they didn't have the expertise or the know-how to build one, and they couldn't afford to buy one. So they were running AM uh, because they they, they couldn't uh, come by anything to, to work sideband, and and uh, that may be where that whole mentality started. But I can remember uh, um, uh, many times. Uh, um, you know, people um, almost being apologetic when you get into a QSO because they were running AM. But uh, I was never apologetic. You know, I said, look, this is all I run. And, uh, uh, you know, if you don't like it, you just uh, move up and down the band, find uh, find another spot. Uh, that's always kind of been my uh, whole uh, attitude about the thing. And, uh and, and, and I have had occasions people try to run me off a frequency, uh, uh, but that tends to uh, be counter-effective because, um, uh, you know, when at one time I uh, I might have uh, relinquished the frequency, but when somebody uh, tries that, you know, then I become uh, more determined than ever to stay on, and you know I'm not going to move. So, uh, you know, you know if. if you know, two can play that game. If someone wants to be uh, rude and arrogant about it, I can be just as rude and arrogant as they are. So, uh, you know, I say, oh, I'm just going to stick right here. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. 
Um, but uh, but as far as the net operation, I, I just the thing about I don't, I don't like about nets is that uh, you know I don't like the idea that you you check into a net and then you give your call sign and then you wait maybe 25 or 30 minutes where it goes through the list and finally it gets around to you for one transmission and then you uh, um, then you turn it back to net control and then. If you stay around another 25 or 30 minutes, uh, it might come back uh, around to you again. Um, uh, but if you don't stay around that long, you know, usually, you know, that's it. But uh, but the, but nobody has like really a, a conversation. You know, each person just makes a a, a little uh, monologue statement, or whatever they wanted wanted to say. But then there's no actually intercommunication because there's such a long period between. Uh, uh, one transmission in the next that there's uh, very little actual uh, two-way conversation so I, I just don't um, enjoy that I uh, um, uh, one net that I have occasionally uh, participated in is on it's usually uh, between Christmas and New Year I didn't even listen for it this year I didn't even try to get uh, get on to it I, I think they had it but uh, it's called the 1936 uh, there's some net up on 1936 that on one night a year between Christmas and New Year's they call it AM night where everybody in the net runs AM and you and you hear AM signals from all over the country you know good solid signals that you never hear any other time and um, uh, they call it the 1936 AM net because they chose that frequency to commemorate uh, the great Ohio River flood back in 1936 uh, um, when uh, amateur radio played a big part in the uh, emergency communications. And to commemorate that, uh, you know, sometimes many years later, that club decided that uh, they would choose 1936 as their, their, their um, net frequency, and it, it meets... Uh, I don't know, what, what is it, every Tuesday night or every Thursday night? Uh, I think it's every Thursday night it meets, and they're usually on sideband, but then they decided, well, one night a year the net would uh, would meet on AM plus invite anybody else in the country. Uh. But I, I don't know whether you can extend that too far. I mean, people are going to understand the ability to create a readable signal being more easy on other modes, you know, like CW than on AM, but I think that's where we get into the part about AM that's uh, a relaxed mode with a carrier that contains a lot of information about punctuation and pacing and the storytelling nature of the mode and of course the audio quality, all of these other things that no other, no other mode can really match. And once they try it, it's like, wow, that does sound good and it is easy to, uh, to kind of settle in. And it is quite satisfying to your point to be able to talk in greater depth about something than the rapid fire kind of chatter that takes place in a, in a dog x-ray or a contest exchange. That's not satisfying to me either. And I think if people try this other mode of communicating where they actually have to think about something, and not only that, but actually consider the thoughts of others, they'll wind up becoming better communicators in an interpersonal way. So I think there's plenty of room to promote this part of the hobby for that purpose and take it from there. Well, all right, it's coming up on 8 o'clock, Don. I think I've got to get back in. I'm out here on the back of the radio lodge. We had a lot of rain today, and we've been keeping the fireplace stoked. The rain has probably ended by now, but I imagine the dogs need to be taken out. Now, speaking of a satisfying QSO, it's been good to run into you. And also to get some pretty good one-on-one -on -one time at good signals. I see that my signal's back up to 20 over. And I see that yours has been up around 20 or 25 over into the same node that I'm uh, listening to myself on. Again, interference, for example, that just fired up on the low side. So let me take it back to you and uh, wrap things up. And I hope to run into you again real soon, Don. K4KYV, WA3VJB. Oh, very good, Paul. K4KYV right back. You know, one, one additional comment, you mentioned something that uh, um, uh, uh, I think on the previous transmission about uh, the AM carrier and punctuation. <laughs> you know, uh, that kind of uh, um, um, uh, made an impression with me because, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, with, with AM and the carrier, uh, you know, that's comparable to reading. Like if you're reading... Uh, um, 
a, a passage uh, in a book or something where you know where you have uh, uh, punctuation and you have paragraphs and spacings between the paragraphs. Uh, um, Whereas the, uh, uh, you know, the typical uh, fast break sideband uh, type of uh, uh, of uh, QSO is like somebody who uh, types uh, one paragraph and they, uh, it's all capital letters, uh, no uh, uh, no spacing um, between uh, between paragraphs, just like one block of text with no. Uh, uh, breaks for paragraphs and uh, and uh, the, maybe the only uh, punctuation being uh, periods. You know every uh, um, uh, you know all capitals. You know trying to read that. If you ever try to read the text that's been uh, sent that way, um, um, you know online or wherever, it's it, it's much harder to. Uh, um, uh, to read it, it takes more effort than if you, you know, than if it's uh, properly, properly uh, punctuated with uh, uh, with upper and lowercase letters and spacing between paragraphs. And to me, uh, that, that uh, you know, AM and the running the full carrier AM is is kind of a, you know, it's an analogous situation. You know, catch you later. WA3 VJB K4KYV. Well, my pleasure, Don. My pleasure. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of where I was coming from on that. And what I was trying to do is uh, counter the long-held claim that the carrier contains no information. And I realized why I can dispute that. And my first analogy was to the mark and space radio teletype protocol. Where the space is just as important as the mark. And I just here on AM pauses between words are as important as the words themselves as far as pacing and punctuation is concerned. And I don't mean just removing the risk of selling somebody else. I mean selling somebody that you haven't finished the rest of your thoughts yet. That's what I'm telling you. I like to announce that you're building on the analogy of paragraph and indentation. If all of this is, is subaudible suing to the person you're, you're having a, a conversation with, what makes it so satisfying? So again, my pleasure, Don, and uh, I think it might be our first contact in the new year, so I will say Happy New Year to you. I hope that everybody is staying happy. I just would not. We want to get to something better. K4KYD is Woodlawn, Tennessee. Top of the hour, WHC, DJ, and all that. Okay, uh, Paul. Well, the pleasure's all mine. We'll we'll catch you next time. So uh, take care. Happy New Year, uh, 73 and all that. Uh, WA3VJB, K4KYV, and now clear.